Good afternoon. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about the main theme of my books, um, which centered around gays in the military and individual rights. But I want to go back to the beginning of the book for a minute. First, let me just run through the pictures. Um, the last few couple, few days, I've just shown some military um, museums, the Army and and um, the Marine Corps Museum. That's the Fort Jackson Gate. That's the Fort Jackson Museum. That's the Army Museum at Fort Belvoir, open to the public. That's the Marine Corps Museum in Triangle. And there's a picture of me in the Marine Corps Museum, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. And um, let me turn to, I'll also just bring up, we're talking mainly about this book, the first one, um, which came out in 1997. But let me turn to page the Roman numeral 13 in the introduction of the first book. And um, I'll just read one paragraph um, at the top of page Roman 13 in the introduction. My central question on personal values is this. Do we believe in the principle that every adult person is totally responsible for himself or, the, or herself? Um, I guess that would be themselves now, but... This objectivistic notion would limit the responsibilities of government to consequentialism. That's an important word, consequentialism. Individuals, through their own conduct and performance, would become their own moral agents. That's personal agency is real important to me. Any individual will, in principle, be held accountable for her actions, regardless of biological or circumstantial parentage. When may an individual rightfully set her own personal priorities, and when should she consider the recognized and established interests of the family and the larger community first? And notice how in 1997, we often use the, fem the female pronoun when it could be both. That was a common courtesy then. That's just kind of interesting. But, um, and also I'll just, I'm going to be at the watching the clips so there are there are i can't see anything at all that's the iso glasses that's just something that's coming up um i'm going to run through this outline and i read that that paragraph um what we're talking about is what we normally call classical liberalism which is distinguished from libertarianism um, Liberalism basically says that individuals can define their own individual purpose in life and own agency as long as they don't disturb others. But individuals might have some collective responsibilities, paying taxes, um, for example, um, some, and we'll get to sometimes other kinds of service. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but an individual's moral character is sort of subsumed by their own overdependence on privileges that they inherited that can be that can undermine their agency there and whether they could can earn what they have with their own labor um now labor could be very liberally interpreted um day trading is labor because you have to know what you're doing to do it successful and you're helping discipline the market if you do it well as long as you do it legally you don't have insider information so it can be very wide to interpretation of what legitimate work is but it's better to earn it yourself than to simply inherit it through a family. And that's an issue for me. Uh, but the but the main thing about this is that you're defining the individual primarily by their own results and their own personal agency, and what they achieve on their own, rather than or what the individual, what he or she achieves, rather than by what they achieve by belonging to an identity group. In other words, we're, we're ignoring the whole idea of oppressor versus oppressed. And so, again, libertarianism refers to reducing government, extreme reductions in dependence on government, particularly federal government, trying to get rid of taxes, trying to get rid of income taxes particularly, trying to privatize all services and let the market um, drive all services. And some, you know, generally our experience with liberalism is that it doesn't work as well with some things like health care 
to do that and maybe some other things, maybe help governing climate change, exploring space. There are some things that we do have to do collectively with government, and, and normally classical liberalism accepts that. Um, but the idea that, that an individual like me should be expected to belong to a group or a tribe, that, that, is, that is toned down and de-emphasized. And then that's, this sort of drives the storyline of the first of the three Do Ask Do Tell books, the one that came out in 1997 when I moved to Minnesota. Um, my own experience, you know, has focused on my own individual rights when they created tension with others and with the cohesion of the, of the family or whatever group I was relating to. And when in turn that group, for example, the family or tribe or anything, could then in turn face external adversities or limitations on down the road. Um, now the the big the big thorn the big thorn in the this is, of course is I think the biggest issue is conscription. Now today, um, selective service registration um, is required for bio young biological males. I, mean, I think it's something like eighteen and a half to twenty five. You'd have to look that up exactly, um, but it's been required since nineteen eight. It's been required against nineteen eighty. We had the draft during both world wars, and it was um, it wasn't questioned very much. Um, and um, during the Vietnam War, it was a big issue. It, um, before, when Kennedy took office in 1961, I think there were deferments for married men and men with children. I'm not sure I remember exactly how it worked, but those went away. Um, in 1964, Kennedy or Johnson actually said he wasn't going to send American boys to Vietnam when he thought um, the, the people that lived there could clean up the problems that were starting to develop. But of course, we had the Gulf of Tonkin, and we had the the um, increase in, in in combat and in 1965, and that led to the draft to his increasing draft calls over and over again. Um, and so that's a lot of the history I cover in the book. And some European in some European Union countries, um, there is male only conscription now. Um, Email sort of inscriptions being added to a couple of them. Um, there are, and right now we've got two wars going on. We've got Ukraine being invaded by Russia, and we've got, then we've got Israel and Gaza. Um, and so when wars are happening in other countries, uh, even though they don't directly affect us directly, we aren't sending troops there. There's sort of an indirect pressure on our system. We, we have refugees maybe to take care of. Um, that the, the, you know the welcome core all there are all, all kinds of other things that we might feel we should be expected in getting involved in doing um so inscription the idea that we had it was a big issue particularly during the early in the middle 60s um, when it was affecting me because we had student deferments and we had student deferments, and if you were got good grades, um, you could get deferred from being drafted. And then if you graduated, particularly if you got graduate degrees in math and science, if you did go into the service, you were likely to get a job you know, that, sh that was away from combat. You were much more likely to not be sent into combat, even though everyone's a rifleman and so forth. Um, so... Um, that was, well, why am I having trouble here trying to get this back? So that was a problem that, um, now, because, because the idea, the, the, the idea in, if you have liberalism, you shouldn't have what amounts to a kind of involuntary servitude. But I think it's more that um, people people have an inherent obligation to be able to face emergencies, to help others face emergencies. 
men had some sort of obligation when I was growing up to protect women and children, and women had an obligation to take care of the things at the home. Now, this is back in the 1950s, but that was the world I was living in. And so it was not considered in, you know, to contradict liberty to, if you did, if you were required to be subject to a draft. And so because that idea can still continue, uh, we have, we, the draft was ended in 1973. In fact, Nixon ended the draft in 1973. And then we renewed, I think, registration later when Afghanistan got in trouble in 1980. And we've had the registration ever since. And Congress keeps looking at it. Um, in fact, back in 1981, the Supreme Court ruled that mail-only conscription wasn't unconstitutional. It was Rusker versus Goldberg. And more recently, it said it wouldn't rule on it because it thought Congress would take care of it. But Congress hasn't really done anything very recently. Now, let, the main reason I wanted to talk a little bit was that liberalism you know, was progressing pretty well in reducing inequities until roughly 2016 uh, with when Trump ran for president and what surprisingly won and so forth. And there are two or three basic reasons, but I kind of wanted to go through what I think really happened is for this part of the video. Um, if you go back to 2010, uh, that was at the end of the end of 2010 is when we uh, repeal, don't ask, don't tell. Actually, finished the repeal in 2011. It was the time my mother passed away, and I got an inherited house, and um, I was sort of taking off in another phase of my life in 2011. Um, Zucker, I think Mark Zuckerberg had been the man of the year at the end of 2010. He went for time. He was like the connector. It was a good time. We had the Arab Spring. We um, thought that things were getting better, and that the internet was going to open up. To everything to debate and critical thinking and things would be much better. And for a while, it seemed like they were. Um, but you started seeing some signs of a little bit of it's craziness. Now, I think the first sign that I noticed was actually on the right, and I'm sort of in this middle myself, so I think you can tell, but remember in the summer of 2011, the debates over the, the debt ceiling with John Boehner and the, Republic, uh, the willingness of hardline Republicans to subject Americans to very serious fiscal risks if if they um, by changing the mean basically changing the meaning of words when you talk what the debt ceiling meant. Well, of course, the left changes the meanings of words now, but the right can do it too, and that's what the the right was doing in 2011 with the debt ceiling. More more recently in 2023, we had another little fight, and McCarthy finally broke a deal and then lost their speakership over it, remember? So both the right and the left have been playing this game. Um, but around 20, you know, YouTube started becoming, you know, video started becoming more important relative to, to his text and blogging, more or less around that time, around 2010, 2011. And um, social media algorithms on um, Facebook started, every, people started getting... Facebook and Twitter accounts, and then other things, WhatsApp and Snapchat, and and eventually TikTok and a bunch of bunch of other things. And social media algorithms became efficient, and people also started to use smartphones in twenty. And here's mine, and use smartphones in around twenty twelve. Remember, we had the flip phones before. And then around, I think we also had the BlackBerry around 2009. And I, I can remember you can get websites on the BlackBerry. You could, I could follow Major League Baseball games on when I was out on the BlackBerry and see what was going on. Um, and that's where finally starting to get better. Uh, but um, I can remember that. But it, around 2012, it started to 2011, 2012, it started to get much easier for people to communicate with each other on social media, on smartphones, as well as simply on personal computers. And then we started seeing, so algorithms um, started to push more extreme claims to get clicks and earn money. And the media tended to find more extreme con content, particularly content that favored ideas on the left, tended to make more money, tended to be more popular. Um, 
And then in, then things started to get tense on the left. We had the Ferguson, Missouri, near St. Louis riots in August of 2014. It was based partly on some false information. But in 2015, remember, there were terrible riots in Baltimore in April, um, where the police, in this case, really were completely at fault. I, I actually went to the site of that in April of 2015. Um, remember, we had had riots all the way back to Rodney King in the early 90s, and remember the O.J. trial in the 1990s, and how people celebrated when he was acquitted. And so, you know, we've had the problem a long time, but it's, it was starting to get a little bit worse. Um, and the enemies of the country, you know, had, going back to 9-11, we had been concerned about radical Islam mainly since about, you know, since the end of two, since the attacks and in September of 2001. And um, in the middle 2000s, they were still pretty serious. There were a couple of very serious incidents in France, you'll remember, in 2015. Um, but we were starting to hear more about North Korea um, with the, their, missile, their missiles and their threats that they could launch missiles all the way to the U.S. And there, there, there were there some incidents like Wambler, remember, and then China and Russia were starting to get more a little bit more unstable. Um, so Trump articulated, you know, the Greens is mostly from the right, from the point of view of the loss of jobs of ordinary working people, particularly the immigration and the globalization. And some of that was overblown and some of that wasn't. Um, the globalization, you know, for example, we're way too dependent on Taiwan for our semi for semiconductor manufacturing for our own good there we would be a lot be, be a lot safer if we moved a lot of manufacturing back to the United States you know in Tennessee and Austin Texas and Michigan and just all in just anywhere you know that you can to back we'd be a lot better if we did a lot more of our man critical stuff and had more raw materials in the United States in fact, we've been finding there have been some controversies about that over finding it on indigenous lands and so forth. At, at a personal level, we were finding that we could, you know, we could relate to other people outside our family and lineages and even outside our own tribal and relate to people with other cultures and religions and other beliefs about sexuality and gender and so forth. We, we could do that, and we, it would be profitable to be very open in the way we accepted other people rather than staying within having this idea of being within our own, tri own tribe. Now, Trump's surprise victory, I remember that day very well, spurned, quickly would spurn more extremism on the left. You'll remember Brett Weinstein at Evergreen in Oregon, that controversy in 2017, the controversy over resegregation, and it was pretty, pretty messy. But in August of 20, in August of 2017, right before I sold my house, of course, we had that entire, and we had that huge attack incident in Charlottesville, um, that rally and that riot the next day, and there was one death in the riot. It was, was a terrific tragedy. And then, of course, the big tech companies had to start um, cracking down on did not, not so much social media as, as much as on domain names, like domains that had extra, very extreme content. And a number of right-wing domains, extreme right-wing domains were shut down. But the idea that a domain, which is normally you pay for, normally doesn't enter the algorithms the way social media does could be shut down was an alarming idea. But that was something that happened after Charlottesville. And um, then we started in 2018, we started seeing more censorship of people. You remember uh, the censorship when Sargon of Akkad and December of 2018 was canceled um, by Patreon over something he had said not on their platform. You were seeing other people be canceled, like Milo Yiannopoulos and so forth. You were seeing people be canceled over behavior not even on their platform that was reported. Um, and that was kind of alarming. And I was starting to become concerned about my own free content model. I didn't, you know, I didn't require people to subscribe. Um, or pay me. Um, I, I couldn't really ask for donations, so I had an inheritance. I didn't 
I didn't know if I would even be allowed to use Patreon if I wanted to because of that. Um, I thought maybe I wouldn't. And so I just, I, I simply put it up free and used low tech and just put up a very large amount of content. And I had my own model for participating, which I've talked about before, and I'm going to have another video about that soon. Um, but it wasn't really commercially viable. I couldn't really prove that I could pay my own way. My books had weren't really selling anymore. And most books don't sell, self-public push, don't sell a long time if they're about specific political issues like mine was. And um, I'm going to talk about that again in another video, the more recent attempts, and it's very interesting and unusual. But um, I basically was depending on the fact that I had inherited money and then had had some assets from when I was working and then had Social Security and had and a couple of annuities and so forth. I was kind of dependent on that too, but I wasn't really making very much money, very little money off my internet, just a little bit in AdSense on Google. Um, so I think this comes to the fact that I was talking, you know, sort of like a Pharisee in the Bible. I was talking a lot, not really doing a lot for other people. And so when this kind of brings you to the second reason why around the middle of the last decade, it started getting harder for it started getting harder um, for people in marginalized groups, particularly particularly um, black people and people Latinos and so forth, to continue rising up. They had done very very well for a, two or several decades, and now they were sort of reaching a, a dead wall and not continuing to improve their situation as much as they had been before. And one of the reasons is that I think um, it had sort of run its course. Liberalism, in a sense, had somewhat run its course in being in using the free market to in any, to help people improve themselves, despite the fact that many minorities were in media, many were in law enforcement, many had been elected to office and were doing very well. There were many left in bad, in, you know, both in rural and in urban communities that were that had been. The, the vic had been experienced systemic oppression or racism or something in the past, and they weren't climbing up on anymore. Now, so there was the 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 left was starting to notice that. So we were turning more to what you would call critical social justice theory, and the left was tr using trying to present the problem is that if you were a simply a member of an oppressor group like white people, you were an oppressor. Not it wasn't the left wasn't talking very much about individual own conduct, individuals own conduct, whether an individual could have earned the earn it idea, whether an individual could have earned what they had themselves. They were looking at if what group did you belong to? And then they were starting to demand that you start fighting for other people, drop what you're doing and listen to their priorities. And that might even have become something if you were going to stay online. And then the reason number three was the 2020 pandemic and people started losing their real world freedom to move around and function. Um, actually, they could stay online. though. Uh, the online part stayed up. So um, do, do, remember during this period, we also had the Pittsburgh anti-Semitic attack in 2018, the New Zealand attack in early March of 2019, and then George Floyd, and then the, the riots in Minneapolis and Portland, Seattle, and then other other incidents too, you know, Louisville and so forth. Um, I, you know, I um, that wasn't really fully aware of the implication of critical social justice theory until during the pandemic, and I heard Robin D'Angelo talk about her book and started hearing more, you know. About Abraham Kendall and so forth, started hearing more about anti the idea that you had to be anti racist, that simply being colorblind wasn't enough. And then I likely wasn't wasn't as aware of the problem with um, gender identity. I thought I saw it as something that was rarely happening, and that transgender was still something that was mostly with adults, and the adults could do what they want. I wasn't very concerned about it until around the latter part of 2021. I started hearing, even though this had been going on for a long time, I started hearing a lot more about it in the latter part of 2021. 
Now, the, the left tended to try to apply measures to groups to repair wrongs that from the past. And speech that would articulate a truth um, was still, would still be shut down if it could harm a marginalized group. And that was that idea was more in play with with the gender identity debate, which I'm, I'm not getting into do now. But you could you weren't allowed to criticize trans activism because trans youth were a marginalized group, and so anything that could be done to help them was expected. In other words, expecting everybody to use their pronouns. Um, as in order to help include people was expected. And Pay PayPal got involved with Cohen Wright over a fight over that idea. And uh, when Cohen published an article in the Wall Street Journal, I remember, and, um, and you know, any anything you were expected to participate in making things easier for marginalized groups, even at the expense of your own intellectual and honesty and integrity. And that was something that was very determined, that was very discouraged to me. You know, it started in academia all the way back in the early 2010s with speech codes and so forth, and it had moved into business with the sort of semi-compelled pronoun use and so forth. Well, that's all I'm going to talk about. That's all I'm going to talk about right now. And there will be a second part of this video to cover what would happen, you know, what happens with illiberal systems on both the right and the left. And we'll talk about those in another video. And I do thank you for listening.